These are five of my favorite houseplant care tips that I wish I knew five years ago when I was just starting out on my houseplant collecting journey. It would have saved me a lot of heartache and hopefully it will you too. Now I consider this first tip to be the most important tip for all houseplant collectors, whether you're experienced or just starting out, and is one that would have saved me so much bother if I knew it five years ago. It's something that not enough people are doing because they don't realize how helpful it is and it's checking plants before buying them. Now this may sound simple, but how many times have you fallen in love with a plant in the nursery and purchased it without giving it a quick check over? Let me know in the comments. Now my personal experience was buying a croton from a local garden center that looked absolutely gorgeous. And it was a plant that was on my wish list at the time. I was giddy with excitement, so I rushed to the counter and handed the cashier my hard earned money took it home and put it proudly on my plant shelving unit and then watched it inexplicably die over the course of three months. The thing that I didn't realize was that I'd accidentally bought a plant with a spider mite colony on it that eventually destroyed the plant. Since that experience, I always checked the plant for pests before buying it. And I see webbing on the underside of the leaves, which is a good spider mite giveaway. Are there blobs of what looks like cotton on the stems and leaves? This suggests a mealybug problem. Are there annoying flea-like creatures hopping around the soil when I disrupt the soil? These are everyone's favorite plant pest, the fungus gnat. If I see any of these issues, I move on to the next plant. Or if I see the problem on multiple plants, I move on to the next shop. As well as checking for pests, you also want to quickly check the overall health of the plant. Pull the plant out of the pot and look at the roots. Avoid a plant that is heavily root bound. Are there any yellow or brown leaves? This suggests a nutrient problem with the nursery not caring for the plant correctly. There's been countless times where I've looked at a plant in a big box store only to see the soil is completely saturated with water. And this is such a shame and suggests the plant is not being looked after correctly. It's probably not worth paying the price they're charging. It's also worth looking at how many stems are in the pot, particularly for vining plants such as pothos and philodendron. The more stems there are, the more bang you're getting for your buck and the bigger and fuller the plant will become. And before I forget, don't get sucked into buying a calafea unless you know what you're getting yourself in for. Do check out my 10 house plant beginners should avoid for more info about this. If you've ever watched any of Plant Arena's YouTube videos, you'll no doubt have been amazed by the remarkably large plants she has in her videos. I know I am. Her plants are an inspiration and a great hack you can implement to get your plants to look as large and full as hers is to take cuttings from your plant and plant them back into the same pot. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about how many plant stems there are in the pot. Growers need to turn a profit when they sell their plants, so they don't tend to pack the pots with lots of stems, and this won't make for a bushy, full plant. When you see a pothos in the garden center, there'll most likely be four stems coming out from the soil, and these are four individual plants. These are rookie numbers and can easily be increased to many more. It's therefore up to us to take cuttings from the plant and add them back into the pot to pack the plant out. Generally, when I do this, I like to fit as many stems into the pot that I can comfortably fit. So the more stems there are, the fuller and larger the plant will become. So take your vining plant and take cuttings along the stem. You can take multiple cuttings from a single stem. All you need to do is cut underneath each leaf node, ensuring that a leaf is still attached. You can plant these straight back into the pot with the mother plant, because cuttings will root in soil. Water isn't the only propagation method. Give them a few weeks to develop roots and new stems, and eventually you'll have a nice big plant on your hands. The cut she made on the original stem won't die. It should grow two healthy new stems from where you made the cut, so you've made the plant extra bushy. A great hack to get a super large Monstera deliciosa is to plant multiple plants into the same pot rather than just one. This will give you lots of vining stems and over time it will grow into a large plant. I wish I knew this hack many years ago because I would have some really big plants right now and my house would look like a jungle, making my wife happy in the process. This next tip is a fantastic hack that I was completely ignorant to a few years ago. and is one that makes your vining plant grow massive leaves and look awesome in the process. And it's simply encouraging your plant to grow vertically up something. It's a little known fact that plants develop bigger and bigger leaves when they're encouraged to grow up something, such as a moss pole, bamboo sticks, or wooden planks. This is generally the case with vining plants, such as philodendron, pothos, monsteras, and syngonium. These plants are tropical and normally live on the forest floor of tropical rainforests in Central America and Southeast Asia. They're surrounded by larger trees 
So they use their aerial roots to latch onto and creep up those surrounding trees to support themselves and to access the natural light that is higher up. This is essentially why their leaves get bigger as they grow taller and higher in the jungle. They are maximizing leaf tissue area so that they can capture as much of the sun's light as possible and use it for photosynthesis so that they can capture and store energy for growth. And we can replicate this in our homes by encouraging our plants to grow up something. Live moss poles are probably the best thing we can use. Here, the aerial roots can grow into the moss that the plant then uses anchor points to grow roots and get stronger as they grow taller. This allows the leaves to get bigger and bigger. If you don't have live moss poles, you can use poles made with burlap that you can tie the stems onto, or even bamboo from the garden. I've started doing this with my Monstera adansoni, Pophos enjoy, and Philodendron lemon and lime, and the new leaves are starting to get bigger as they develop at the top of the plant. If you want to get a plant to climb up a moss pole, you do need to repot the plant and start again. Don't ram the pole into the existing pot because this can damage the roots of the plant. You want a fairly large pot so that the moss pole will be secured safely in the soil so that it doesn't flop over when you have your plant climbing up it. Fill up the pot with your normal potting soil and insert the pole near the back of the pot. Make room in the soil and place your plant next to the pole. You now need to grab some gardening tape or string to secure the stems onto the pole. Then you continue doing this until you have all your stems tied to the moss pole. You should now start to see your plant push out larger and larger leaves until you have a massive plant. This next tip will save you lots of money. You don't need to buy premium soil mixes for your houseplants. When we start getting into houseplants in a big way, and we're in the shops 10 times a week buying plants, we have the best intentions for our plants and can easily be tempted into buying soil mixes that we think will make our plants extra healthy and look lush. The problem is though that these soil mixes can be very expensive and costs can mount up if we have loads of plants. These soil mixes often list lots of fancy ingredients that no one actually knows what they are or what they do for our plants. You'll see all sorts of things in there from lime to alfalfa meal to kelp meal to hummus, all charged at a premium price. My advice though is to keep it simple and make your own potting soil from just two ingredients, compost for water retention and nutrients and some perlite added for drainage. These two ingredients work fine for all of my plants, regardless of what they are. I use the same soil mix for aroids and succulents and they all seem to like it. For non-succulent plants, I mix approximately five parts compost to two parts perlite and for succulents, I up this to three parts perlite. Using something like perlite in your potting mix is important for good drainage so that the soil doesn't hold onto too much water and rot the roots. And this is particularly important for succulents. If you don't have access, to perlite then you can use something else such as grit or pumice as long as it's porous it will work just as well as perlite in increasing drainage in the soil house plant humidity is a much talked about topic and one that confuses a lot of plant owners including myself we all know that plants such as calafeas and zebra plants in particular need humidity to stop them getting crispy brown edges on the leaves. This is because they hail from tropical regions where humidity is consistently high year round. The key word there though is consistency. This next tip really struck home when I watched a great video from Lee at Kill This Plant where he talks about this in great detail. Plants crave consistency above everything else. So we assume that our plants need high humidity to thrive. So we may chuck on a humidifier for a few hours each day and then turn it off for the remainder of the day. But this is exactly what our plants don't want. They don't necessarily want high humidity, but instead they want consistent humidity. This means placing your plant somewhere in your home where it doesn't get sudden drops in humidity, such as away from external doors, windows, and radiators. This is why we don't really see good results when we miss the leaves of our plants. This really doesn't do anything for your plant, and especially doesn't create a consistent level of humidity. All these tips are fantastic for your plants, but will mean absolutely nothing if you consistently overwater your plant. So you really need to watch this video here to understand the signs that you're giving your plant too much water.